I made it. It's a long stage. I was uh, at a conference in uh, Los Angeles about a year ago, and there was a stage that was four times as big as this. And when I came on, as I walked across the stage, the music they played was David Bowie, Let's Dance. <laughs> That's cruel. Just cruel. <laughs> anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you will forgive me, I hope, if I speak in English. Uh, it's going to be a longer lecture as a result, <laughs> more interesting than if I speak in French. If I speak in French, I will only talk about my favorite things, which takes two minutes. Actually, I, I have learned a lot of French over time. When I was at school, my favorite lesson was French, when I was growing up in Liverpool. I loved French. Actually, I loved the French teacher. I did, yeah. Monsieur Evans. <laughs> It's a long story. But I was very impressed, because this was Liverpool in the 1960s, and uh, England was a very different place in the 1960s. In those days, people in Britain didn't believe they were part of Europe, for example. So things have changed a lot, you know, since... <laughs> isn't, isn't it ridiculous? Listen, I have a problem. Um, I am from England, and I, so I come from a country that recently voted by a narrow margin to pretend it is not in Europe. But I now live in America. I've lived there for 17 years. This is a country which just voted by a narrow margin to pretend it's not part of the world. So I'm going to come and live in France, I think, <laughs> at least. <laughs> I mean, you know who you are <laughs> and that you are in Europe, so this is great. No, so I love French. I, uh, I love the French teacher. Um, I loved uh, the culture that I learned about. Uh, I also found I could speak it. I won't do it today, maybe later on over a drink. But I also, at school, I had to study German. And I realized that it's impossible to speak German. Nobody can speak German. It's a fraud, the whole thing. And I know people pretend they can, but I have tried it. I was told at school, and I'm telling this for a reason, that um, I wanted to do art at school. But I was told it was impossible to study art and German. I thought they were making a conceptual point, that <laughs> it was mentally impossible to do art and speak German at the same time. But it was because it conflicted on the school schedule. And so I said to my head teacher, what should I do? And he said, you should do German. I said, why? He said, it will be more useful. Now, I want you to think about this as we go on, because it struck me at the time when I was 14 as a ridiculous idea. I don't mean that German is not useful. It is very useful, especially in Germany. <laughs> well, even quite small children speak it. But the idea that, which is associated with it, that art is not useful is something that permeates most education systems. It sadly is true here in France, is it not? That there are certain, certain disciplines taught in school which are important and other ones that are not important. You can more or less divide education, the experiences that you've had and that your children are having in education, into two sorts of subject, useful ones and useless ones. And the useful ones, you know, are the ones that are thought to be associated with academic work or with getting a job. And the useless ones are the ones that are thought to be uh, culturally interesting 
but unlikely to advance your life in any way. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is that I was delighted to be asked to come and speak at USI because I think it's a very important gathering, and I wanted to offer congratulations right at the beginning of the conference to Francois and the team, because very often, conferences, as you know, bring together people from similar dis disciplines and domains, and people talk to each other through the kind of patois of their own professional interest. One of the features of this conference is it brings together people across disciplines and from different sectors, from business, from education, from technology. And I think it's vitally important that these sorts of conversations happen, and they happen more often. And I think it's a great testament to Francois and the team to have brought together you as a group and also the, the panel of speakers that you have coming up. What I also love about it is it's meant to be a conversation, and we're going to have one shortly. I, gave, I spoke an event recently. Uh, it was, it, it was a, a peace conference in Vancouver. It was called the Vancouver Peace Conference. They're very good at titles in Canada. And the guest of honor was the Dalai Lama. I hosted the opening session. There were 13 people on the stage, including His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And I, I facilitated it. So Francois had to introduce me. I had to introduce the Dalai Lama. This is difficult because in the uh, belief system of, of, uh, of Buddhism, the Dalai Lama is the same spirit who has inhabited that role for over 2,000 years. So there's a lot to include <laughs> you know, in an introduction. Anyway, he said a couple of very wonderful things. One of them was, and I want to come back to both of them. One of them was, he said, to be born at all is a miracle. What are you going to do with your life? He wasn't speaking to me, he was speaking to the room. It amazes me how many people get locked into a track in their lives and go on to live lives they don't find very interesting or fulfilling. Um, and I always compare that to people I have met who love what they do and believe they're doing what they're meant to do and that when they do it, they're at their most authentic. The second is, somebody asked him a question at one point and he took a very long time to answer it. And then he said, to this room full of expectant uh, followers. Uh, he leant forward and we thought, here we go. And he said, I don't know. We're a bit surprised, honestly, because we thought you're the Dalai Lama. You know, <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? And he said, I'd never thought of that. What do you think? Now, the reason that matters to me is because it, it characterizes something that doesn't happen very often in education. Here is one of the world's great teachers who is quite prepared to say, I don't know something. And what it illustrates is that nobody does know everything, no matter how learned they are. Human knowledge is a densely woven fabric that draws together expertise from different lives, different disciplines, different perspectives, and different cultures. One of the great adventures currently in, in human understanding, facilitated by technology, is Wikipedia. I had the pleasure of helping to launch a fundraising event in Los Angeles recently for Wikipedia. It's the most astonishing achievement, if you think of it. There are millions of people involved, working together like some great tapestry, weaving together this enormous fabric of knowledge and correcting each other as we go. There's never been a collaborative enterprise on this scale ever before, not since the great libraries in Egypt were destroyed. And what it makes clear is that knowledge is a collective um, possession that we all contribute to. The other thing I liked about him saying this was that here was one of the great teachers of the world saying, I don't know, what do you think? And what it illustrates is that teaching properly conceived in education is not a monologue. I mean, I, forgive me this morning, but it's not a monologue, it's a conversation. All the great teachers are great students, and all the great students are teachers. Now, none of these principles applies in the way we currently educate our children. We give our children choices between useful and use, useless subjects. We don't encourage conversation between disciplines. We don't encourage an exchange between teachers and students. And we don't bring together people across cultures. And what I want to say just at the very beginning of the conference is that this conference does all of that. And I think it represents principles that we should all of us be working collectively to build into our education systems. There's no question in my mind that our education systems are no longer fit for the purpose that we intend for them. And that all the things you're going to talk about over the next few days 
have to be associated with a transformative way of thinking about how we educate our children and how you educate yourselves and the people who work with you and for you. A lot of people are persuaded by an old story in education. The story is that you go to school to learn a series of subjects and you pass exams and with good fortune you'll go to a good university and then you'll get a degree and then you'll get a job. And if we know anything now, this is a model that was designed in previous times for other challenges and it doesn't work anymore. So it's essential that we rethink it and having the business community and the technology community in the conversation is vitally important. So, um, I, I work a lot in education, I work a lot with businesses, I work a lot in the cultural sector, and have done for a long time, and there are three big propositions that underpin the work I do and have come to uh, be very uh, committed to. Uh, that, that's roughly this, one of them is, and I think these will run through the whole conference, one is that we all of us, wherever we are, whether we're in England, or Europe, <laughs> America, or the world, that all of us, whether we like it or not, are caught up in a genuine, full-bore, full-throttle, unmitigated revolution. And I don't mean this figuratively, I mean literally, you know that, I don't need to harp on this, it's literally true. You know, the world has had many revolutions in the past. Uh, we've had at least three industrial revolutions so far. Uh, we have had political revolutions, cultural revolutions, um, all of which are still playing out. I remember years ago when um, uh, Richard Nixon first went to Beijing, he was told that the Chinese Premier, Chen Lai, was a great student of Western uh, history. And evidently, at the prompting of Henry Kissinger, uh, Nixon said to Chen Lai, um, as they walked around the Forbidden City, what do you think has been the effect on Western civilization of the French Revolution. And without pausing for breath, Chu and Lai said, it's too soon to say. I think it's a wonderful observation, isn't it? Well, you know, it's true. The, the French Revolution still is reverberating through European culture. These things don't end, they just add to the, the mix. We've always had revolutions. But there's every reason to suppose that the revolution that's happening now has no precedent in human history in terms of its scale, implications, and impact. And there are two driving forces. One of them is technology. I think all the evidence is that as interesting as digital technology has so far proved itself to be, what lies ahead of us is far more dramatic, far more transformative than what lies behind us. Your children are heading into a world that you don't understand, you can't predict, and nobody else can. And it will be more tumultuous than the world that we're currently living in. And the second is the massive growth in human populations and its impact on the world's natural environment. So there's a revolution. The second is, if we're to make sense of this revolution, we have to think differently about our talents and our abilities, and your children's abilities in particular. And the third is, if we do all of that, we have to behave differently, we have to run our institutions differently, we have to rethink the principles on which we do business, on which we run education, and on which we do our politics. I think it's as important and transformative as, as all of that. Now, um, the good news is, because time is short today, that I have written a book about all of this. So you have nothing else to worry about. You, you simply need to buy this book, <laughs> which is entitled The Answers. Now, here it is. Um, you will notice that this is in French. It wasn't in French when I wrote it. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been a short pamphlet. <laughs> it's the English title was Creative Schools Transforming Education from the Ground Up. I wrote it in part because I've worked in education all of my professional life. A lot of people came to know about the work I do because of some talks I gave at the TED conference years ago, which the organizers, the first talk, they called it Do Schools Kill Creativity? And I thought it was very important to explain that they don't have to kill creativity, they just do. Uh, and that part of the great challenge and adventure for all of us with any collective interest in our lives, our communities, and our children is to rethink the fundamental principles on which we are running our education systems. Now, I'm going to sp explain a little bit more about it, but can I ask you first, how many of you here have got children? Okay, or grandchildren? Great. Okay. And the rest of you have seen such children? 
small people. Well, uh, how, how many of you have got two children or more? All right, look, I will make you a bet, and I will win this bet. Uh, my bet is, if you've got two children or more, I bet you they are completely different from each other, aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. You know, <laughs> I'm constantly getting you confused. The point is, every child on Earth, just like you, is a unique moment in human history, unrepeatable, unprecedented, with a unique mix of talents, abilities, interests, dispositions, and possibilities. And there are some features, though, that all children have in common. One is all children are desperately curious. There is a very important difference between learning, education, and school. Children love to learn. They don't all like education, and some have a big problem with school. Can I ask you, how many of you here really enjoyed your time at school? And please do, some people did. How many did not? Okay, about half and half. How many of you here are now doing exactly what you thought you'd be doing with your life when you were 15? Okay, <laughs> not so many. I mean, some of you may be in the field you wanted to be in. I wanted to be a doctor or a business leader, and I am. But even then, it's unlikely that you're leading the exact life you had in mind, if you had anything in mind. And there's a reason for it, which I'll come back to. But I want to take you right back to the beginning here. Uh, we've just, by the way, I'm not going to show you pictures, don't worry, but uh, my wife and I have just welcomed our first grandchild. Uh, she is two months old. And by a happy coincidence, she's the most brilliant and beautiful baby that was ever born. <laughs> which is great, isn't it? <laughs> and it happened to us. So I feel sorry for the rest of you who don't have this child. But... Anyway, this is not a picture of her, but I came across this. I'm going to tell you what this is. And I just want to keep this in mind as we go through. This is... I came across this on the internet. This is a, a little boy, toddler, um, and his parents give him a present. This is just a random video from YouTube. I just love it. Uh, the, his parents gave him a present, and he opens it. I'll tell you what it is. You don't have to wait for the surprise. What I want you to look at is, is his reaction. So he opens the present, and it's a banana. Okay? Why his parents gave him a banana? We don't know, but they did. <laughs> but watch his reaction to the banana. Open it. Open it. Banana. I got banana. I got banana. I got banana. Yeah, I got banana. You're gonna bring it home. What do you say? Thank you. I got my the banana. Isn't that? It's fantastic, isn't it? You know, I think we should take another look at bananas. <laughs> Honestly, I think we're taking them for granted. But, but isn't that a wonderful reaction? That's how curious young children are when they're born. Everything is wonderful and marvelous. I mean, it, it eases off a little bit as they get older. It, you know, it gets less excited. It's, it's, it's just as well, honestly. I mean, going to a supermarket would be awful, wouldn't it? If, <laughs> if we were all still like this at the age of 35 and 40. You know, <laughs> you couldn't go to restaurants, could you? Honestly, <laughs> I got a salad. Yes, it's fine. It's okay. Relax. But <laughs> it's going to be okay, honestly. This is the thing. Human beings, as a species, you know, there, there's very little, really, that distinguishes human beings from the rest of life on Earth, is there? And we make too much of the differences. We are mortal, organic creatures who depend on the planet to be here at all and for the brief lives that most of us have, comparatively speaking. Um, but something clearly does set us apart. And there are various ways of describing it. I'm going to come to one of them in a minute. But one of the foundational differences is that we are so deeply curious as creatures. We are fascinated by the world around us. I mean, this child will go on within the next year or so to speak fluently in whatever language he's exposed to. Children do. Our granddaughter, 
daughter will in ordinary circumstances, you know, barring some physical impairment. And the interesting thing is they will learn to speak and nobody will teach them how to do it. You know, if you're a parent, you did not teach your child to speak, did you? You didn't because you couldn't, because you don't know how you do it either. Even if you did, it's too complicated. You don't sit your child down, do you, at the age of two and say, we need to talk, you know, or, or more particularly, you do. And this is how it works, and you explain to them the fundamentals of grammar and how the subjunctive operates in the conditional sense. You don't do that. They just take it in through their skin. Learning is the most natural process that we inherit as human beings. Learning is the process of acquiring new skills and understanding. This child will, if this child is exposed to five or six languages, he will learn five or six languages. And there's no natural limit. You don't reach a point where you think, I can't take any more languages, keep my grandmother out of here. And, and they have no problem distinguishing them. Children at a young age don't think, am I speaking German now or French or English? Which is it? They just know. Learning is the most natural thing. The problem is with education. A lot of kids start to lose interest in learning when we begin to educate them. Education is a more intentional process of learning. Uh, it's a more organized process, and it happens for a couple of reasons. One of them is that we educate our children because we believe there are things they need to learn that we don't want to leave to chance. Uh, there may be cultural ideas, uh, they may be intellectual propositions. And secondly, we educate them because we think there are some things they need to learn that are too difficult to, uh, to get the hang of just by yourself, like calculus. It's unreasonable, isn't it, to expect a child to go and invent calculus by the age of six, since only two people in the whole of human history managed to do it in their adult years. There are four reasons why we have education systems. One is economic. We educate our children so they will be suited to the world of work that they will be going into. This is one reason to question the current education system. It's almost now entirely unsuited to the world of work that you are helping to create. There are social reasons why we educate our children, so they understand the nature of the, un of the world and the, the social systems in which they operate. There's a lot of evidence they're not holding together as well as they should do. There are cultural reasons and there are personal reasons. Every education system in the world, including in France, um, is currently in, the, in, in a process of being reformed. And in my view, it's not working, and it's affecting your children, your grandchildren, and their children, and it will continue to do so unless we do something about it. The reason is that the reforms are being based on principles which are um, hostile to the kind of environment in which our children are growing and the sorts of lives they're likely to lead. It's why it's urgently important that we should reinvent them. And let me just give you a quick example. Um, I'm sure you've come across something like this in your own, let me go back. You recognize this, don't you? This is familiar. Um, this is what happens by the time we get through education. We start out being fascinated by bananas, and in no time at all, we're sitting here. Now, I'm not saying all this is terrible, don't get me wrong, but the worldwide movement to reform education is based on two strategies, essentially. One of them is standardization. Now, it's worth remembering that your child is different from every other child in the world. But when they get into education, what the schools tend to look for, not because teachers want to, but because the political system requires it, is not what people can do individually, but what they can do in common. This is, this is part of the problem. And the second is competition. Uh, our education systems become intensely competitive. There's another way of showing you this picture. Let me explain what this is. This is a picture taken in the Indian province of Bihar, B-I-H-A-R. I'm not showing you this in criticism of Bihar or the challenges they face. This caused a big problem in Bihar when the picture was first put into the press a couple of years ago. Let me tell you what this is, though. Uh, in this building, there are young people who are taking um, an examination, a test, which is essential to get them to the next level of their education. I think they're 16 years old. The people on the, hanging on the wall are their parents. The parents are climbing the wall and handing pieces of paper through the window with the answers to the quiz. It's the kids. What you can't see 
because the picture doesn't go that far, are the hundreds of other parents who are waiting to climb up to their children with their, their, their paper. Now, I show you this not because I think there's something especially terrible happening in Bihar, but because metaphorically, we're doing the same thing here. We're doing the same thing in America. Parents, as it were, are being driven up the wall in order to get their children through this competitive system. So we have systems of education which are based on extreme competition, high-stakes testing, and on standardization. And there are very good reasons to suppose it won't continue to work. It, in fact, it's not working now. What I want to do is explain what I think the alternative looks like. There are really, currently, four, uh, sorry, three key principles which underpin the, the education system. The first of them is conformity. When human life actually thrives on creativity, um, I'm, I'm going to, can I just conduct a quick quiz here for you? I'm going to ask you two questions uh, and answer these as honestly as you can. Uh, the first question is, if you think about creativity, how creative are you personally? How creative do you think you are? Have a think about that. Um, if you can, think of that on a scale of 1 to 10, okay, with 10 at the top. The second question is, how intelligent are you on a scale of 1 to 10? Okay? Now, uh, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. You don't have to. You can say, I'm sorry, uh, this is not why I came out this morning. <laughs> I'm at the Louvre. We, we, we don't do this type of thing here. Uh, but let me assure you, if you do put your hands up, there are no social consequences. <laughs> I mean, for me. <laughs> I mean, it may be a disaster for you, I've no idea. But let me just quickly check it, okay? Um, think about creativity first. How many of you would give yourselves 10 for creativity? Thank you. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. By the way, do look around because the <laughs> The people at the front think all the really smart people are at the back now, so <laughs> they already voted. Four, three, two, one. Okay. Where was the top of that curve, would you think? Hmm? Around seven? Six or seven? Okay. How about intelligence? Now, I know a subtle, certain modesty comes in now, we are in friends. <laughs> you should do this in America. So <laughs> okay, how about 10 for intelligence? Who gives us 10 for intelligence? Thank you very much, somebody at the back, that's right. That's great, thank you. As intelligent as it's possible to be, right there. You can go now, by the way. <laughs> We're just wasting your time. <laughs> nine. How about nine? Thank you. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. <laughs> it's getting tense, isn't it? <laughs> Two. Okay. I never do one. If you've got one, you don't understand this anyway, do you? I say. <laughs> no idea what we're talking about, have you? <laughs> You're still worrying about me learning French. All right. Where was the top of that curve? For intelligence. I think about seven. Okay. Now, look, I think you're all wrong about this. But what I wanted to think about, well, first, one last question. How many of you gave yourselves different marks? Okay. That's the thing that interests me. So the question is, what were you thinking of when you gave yourselves marks for creativity? What was in your mind? What were you assessing? The reason I say this is there are a lot of misconceptions about creativity. A lot of people equate creativity with being artistic. So they may hear you say, if, um, when, uh, when you say, are you creative, they think you're being asked, are you artistic? You know, do you play a guitar or an instrument? Do you dance? Are you in an opera company? The point is that creativity is a function of human intelligence. 
It's the capacity for having original ideas that have value. And you'd be creative at anything at all that involves your intelligence. So the second question is, what did you have in mind when I asked you about intelligence? What were you giving yourselves a mark for? What do you think intelligence is that you can give yourself a mark for it? Part of my argument here is that our education systems are rooted in a very narrow view of intelligence. That's why I think of them as promoting conformity. They offer a very particular view of intelligence based on the idea of academic ability, the sort of intelligence you need to get into a good university. But if all we had was academic ability, most of human culture wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't have a business, there would be no practical technology, there would be no architecture, no design, no engineering, uh, no practical business at all, uh, no love, no relationships, no social cohesion. Uh, academic ability, important though it is, is a very narrow conception of the full breadth of human intelligence. But we tend to uh, conceive of education primarily in terms of promoting academic ability. So maybe if you give yourself one or two or five for intelligence, uh, my question is, you know, what conception of intelligence are you working on? So our current systems of education are based on this narrow view of intelligence. That's why I say they're about conformity. When human life is characterized by diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of ability, diversity of talent, our communities and your businesses depend on a very wide range of intellectual capacities and not only those that you associate with verbal reasoning. The second principle on which education is based is compliance. If you have a conformist view of education, it's important that you get people to stick to it, which is why there is so much emphasis on examinations and institutional conduct, when our systems actually thrive on innovation. And the third is that our systems, for the most part, are based on the idea of linearity, on supply and demand. So a bit like agricultural, uh, a bit like industrial uh, manufacturing. It's why, for example, these days there's a big emphasis on the so-called STEM disciplines, in schools, science, technology, engineering, and math, when above all now, we need to have a, a more generous conception of the range of disciplines that we need to meet these various objectives. So we have three principles, conformity, compliance, and linearity. Uh, and the ones I think we should be promoting in schools and education generally are creativity and diversity and the idea that human life is not linear, it's organic. Um, it's why none of you could really plan your lives out uh, properly. Now, the reason I say that this principle is important, that the organic principle is this, that there is, as you know, a profound difference between social systems and physical systems, and between the physical sciences and the social sciences. Uh, the, the physical sciences have been remarkably successful to date in analyzing and, then, and, and formulating laws about how the physical world operates, uh, in physics, in chemistry, in biology, and so on. The social sciences have had a dismal record, not in analyzing and observing how people behave, but in predicting how they might behave in certain conditions. Probably the worst case of it is economics. You know, economics has for years tried to pretend it's a physical, you know, a natural science. And it's really a, a, a kind of um, intuitive game of prediction. The, the great uh, economist, J.K. Galbraith, once said, the primary purpose of economic forecasting is to make astrology seem respectable. And you know that. I mean, every cash flow, every business plan is an act of hope and a, a kind of a vague exploration of imaginative possibilities, quite likely to be thrown apart by contingency. Most of technology is essentially unpredictable in its consequences. Uh, you know, that's to say, technologies are invented for a purpose, but then people turn them to entirely different purposes which were never anticipated. And the reason is that human beings behave in relation to each other's behavior and then act creatively on their own experiences. So it's a constant vortex. For example, uh, in 1898, I think it was, there was a woman who occupies an, an odd place in human history. Uh, her name is Bridget Driscoll. Uh, she's the first person in history to have been killed by a motor car. It was at the uh, Crystal Palace, at the, uh, the Grand Exhibition in London, and she went to see the, an exhibition of the horse's carriage, as it was then called in the UK. Uh, it was traveling along at five miles an hour. She couldn't get out of the way. It was all happening too quickly. She was knocked down, went to hospital, and died of her injuries two days later. The London coroner returned a verdict of accidental death. He said this was a freak accident, and we must ensure this sort of thing never happens again. Well, it did, didn't it? 
more or less, more people have died in motor car accidents than in all armed conflicts combined over the same period. The toll of, on human life of motor cars, let alone the toll on the environment, was not part of the original plan of Benz and Mercedes and of Henry Ford. It's the impact of contingent and emergent qualities. For example, I was re-watching recently uh, Steve Jobs launching the iPhone, which you'll recall only came out in 2007. And think how that's changed the world since then. Um, when the iPhone came out and then the iPad, it was simply seen as a much more efficient way of getting information and being in touch with each, with each other. Uh, the impact has been far-reaching in almost every field of life. One of, the, one of the effect of digitization, for example, has been this, that we have now seen, um, I'll just get this up here, Oh, let me just go back to the beginning. One of the effect is on, on the economy. And of course, we know the way jobs have been swept away. One of the big challenges we face in education, one of the consequences of this preoccupation with academic work, is there has been a massive spike in youth unemployment. There are about 1.1 billion young people around the world, including well, people between the ages of five, uh, 15 and 24. 13% of them are out of work or have never been in work. That's about 75 million people. Youth unemployment runs at about twice the rate of adult unemployment. That's the average. It's what adults are like. And you know, in parts of Europe, youth unemployment is running at over 50%, particularly in some of the Mediterranean states. Education is meant to be preparing people for the economy uh, in some respects. One of the reasons it's happening, but the preoccupation, this is happening, by the way, while millions of jobs, as you know, are unfilled. Um, so in terms of the economic purposes, uh, our education systems are not fulfilling their promise, in part because the, the world of work has been changed so dramatically by digital culture. But there are some other intended consequences. I mean, Steve Jobs, I just, I just love this picture. Um, I mean, I grew up in 1950, 1960, as I say. Um, we, we didn't have any gadgets of any sort. I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing. But you know, our kids now are spending most of their waking hours like this, in front of gadgets. None of this was mentioned in the job spec or the product specification for the iPhone or the iPad. But this has had the most extraordinary tumultuous effect on social life, social relationships, and on levels of personal anxiety. There, there's a mounting concern now of the effect of being engaged with digital technologies on the cognitive and emotional development of our children, and in particular, the impact of social media on the um, on the way it's impeding children's actual social development. But again, it's the law of unintended consequences. This wasn't part of the plan. It's just one of the things that, that comes about. But of course, this is before we even get serious uh, with, uh, with artificial intelligence. That's why I'm saying all the gadgets we've seen so far are um, a kind of a rehearsal for the great tumults that's probably heading our way in the next generation. So one of the things we know about cultural life and social life is it's, it's, it's unpredictable. Uh, it's uh, driven by contingencies and by emergent qualities. And yet our education systems are still based on the idea of linearity, of supply and demand, the idea that academic subjects are the ones that get you through your life, that if you get a degree, life will be good, and uh, we can move forward confidently. Now, I believe we have to reinvent the whole system. It has to be invented on principles of collaboration. It has to be invented on reinvented on principles of distributed expertise. It has to become more localized, more personalized, and more customized. The good news is we can do it. Let me just show you this quick puzzle. Uh, you just gave, recently gave yourselves marks for creativity. Um, I'm going to end with a comment on that in just a minute. But how many of you here speak Dutch? OK, you have a small advantage here now as there is, a, there is a Dutch subtitle. This is on Dutch television. This is a puzzle, see if you can solve it. Um, I'll tell you what the setup is. Uh, you'll see here there's a room, there's a table in the room, in the middle of the table there's a plastic tube, at the bottom of the tube there is a peanut. People go in, they have to get the peanut out of the tube. That's it. That's the whole quiz, okay? See if you solve it.
Did you? <laughs> How many of you got that? Good. I didn't when I first saw it. Look, a quick comment on this. Uh, the first is, most people don't get that on the first look. Uh, by the way, the ape did. The ape solved the problem. You know, so there's hope. <laughs> Not really. Honestly, if it all goes wrong, we, we can turn to the apes for help. Um, what, the reason I show that to you is this. Most people struggle to solve that problem. Not everybody, but many people do. And yet, all the resources that were needed to solve the problem were right there in the room. Uh, the problem was that people didn't connect the resources to the challenge. You can see that most people thought, well, this is, you know, this is really very perplexing. Um, there was a bottle of water at the back of the room, a little bowl of fruit. And you can see that most people thought, well, that's very nice of the people who've organized this, this challenge. <laughs> to lay on some refreshments. But they didn't connect it to the problem. The people who solved it did. They saw everything that was available as relevant to the problem they were trying to solve. And it's one of the key dynamics of genuine innovation and transformative work that we are expansive in our understanding of the resources as well as open in our understanding of what the problem is. And I believe that in education, we are faced now with some deep problems but they are caused by the system itself, not by the teachers, not by the students, not by you as parents or as professional leaders. We have all the resources we need to deeply enrich, improve and transform education as long as we understand what they are. And the deepest resources are human talent. Human talent is very diverse, it's highly dynamic and it's often hidden beneath the surface. So our way forward here is to rethink the fundamental nature of human talent. So when I asked you whether, how creative you are or how intelligent you are, the fact that many of you marked yourselves down, to me, is an illustration of the depth of the problem. Because like that child with the banana, you were born with deep creative talents and possibilities. The trouble is identifying them and then knowing how to cultivate them. So a better question for me is not how creative are you, but how are you creative? What are the areas in which your, your mind most comes alive, the things that stimulate you most, and were they ever touched in education? And the second is, not how intelligent are you, but how are you intelligent? How, you know, what is the range of your own abilities? I published a book a little while ago called The Element, which is about that very thing. We'll talk about it maybe just before we're done. But the fact is we have the resources we need, providing we have the vision and the imagination to connect them with the problem. And that means breaking out of the old model. The old story that if you go to college, you get a degree, and we sacrifice everything for that, the world will be fine. The fact is, it won't be. We have to rethink the fundamental nature of human talent and resources, beginning with that expansive sense of imagination, creativity with which we're born. I think business has a huge role in that. Technology will help to facilitate it. It won't be the whole, problem, the whole answer. It will be part of an answer that's still unfolding. But there can't be a bigger challenge for us just now than to reconceive and reimagine how we educate our children. By the way, even when we do it, if we do it, we still won't be able to predict the future, but we'll have a future, and so will our children, and they'll be grateful to us that we help them to create it. Thank you.